My name is Jay Pace, I'm the principal at Providence Property Group, and today we're going to take you through some really interesting research, and we're going to also show you some of the strategies that we use that are a result of that research to help our clients create wealth, pay less tax, and also pay off their homes faster. So just a bit of a quick introduction to Providence, just adding to what Catherine was saying before. Uh, we've been around since 2006. We help Australians secure better financial futures for themselves and their families. We advise people all over Australia, not only you know, what property to buy and where to purchase, but also when to sell, because exiting is also a very important part of the investment process. Our national team advises on all types of uh, commercial, residential property, and we've success successfully advised on the purchase of almost 2,000 properties since inception. And uh, our advice works out to around 60% investment, around 40% owner-occupier. And as I said before, clients come to us because they want to pay less tax, they want to increase their wealth, and they want to pay their home loans. So one of the most important questions that we probably get is how do I engage you or what do you kind of do for me once we start talking together? So I thought I'd just run you through this real quick and that's going to be all that I'm going to be talking about for Providence and for the rest of it, it's just going to be our research and strategy. Is that fair? Just to make sure these subjects are all relevant, I just want to quick gauge the show of hands. Who here lives in a property? <laughs> Fantastic. All the people with your hands up, listen to people that don't have your hands up. So it's next year they'll help you maybe leave in a property one day. So, so quickly, what we basically do is after we identify your, your need to purchase a property and the goals that you require to get to, we have an initial phone call. It usually lasts about 15, 20 minutes for us to get a bit of an understanding there of your goals and circumstances. Then we move to having a face-to-face -face meeting, very similar to a fact-finding one that you may have with the financial planners here at Nexia, where we sit down and get a, a deeper understanding as to what you like, what you don't like, what your previous uh, interactions have been with property, your history, was it good, was it negative, et cetera, what lessons did you learn? Then from there, we send you a summary of our proposed strategy and what we recommend. It's all obligation-free, it's just to give you an understanding of what we may do. If you agree to that, you say, yep, yeah, this is exactly what I'd like, and these are the goals that I'd like to obtain. We then start the process to locate, assess, and negotiate. There are the three main things that we do for our clients, and research overlays on top of all of that from a macro, micro, and then property perspective. And we'll go through a little bit of that later. After we've done that, we start to present opportunities to you that make sense, that meet your criteria, that meet your stage in life, where you'd like to be next, etc. After we've selected the property and we both agree that it's the right property for you and we've got it at the right price, then Providence assists with the pre-settlement and post-settlement process. So making sure that we've got somebody who's doing the quantity surveying, so we've got a depreciation schedule, we've got the right rental manager if it's an investment property, that we've got the right inspections that are being done for the property, etc. And then basically from that point on, to make sure that the journey doesn't just end there, We'll contact you once a year for a review of the property. It's just like a stock portfolio at the end of the day. We need to understand if the catalyst we originally identified, which made us believe in the first place that the property was going to reach the goals that we agreed to, somebody needs to be checking up on that. And that's what we do. So that's enough about us. I'm going to hand you over to Simon Harris. So Simon Harris is the research director and co-founder of Providence Property Group. He's very well known in the industry for his commentary on the property market. He's a bit shy, but he loves a round of applause. So can we get it together for Simon Harris? Thank you, Jay, and uh, good morning. Look, uh, we wanted to take you for a few minutes around how we look at the states and territories are performing. Um, when we are in the process of doing our research and looking uh, for opportunities for our clients, we're very conscious that the investor dollar in particular is portable. Uh, we can really go anywhere in the country or even anywhere in the world for that matter. So our focus is not in our own backyard, just, just in Sydney. Certainly Sydney's part of um, what, we, what we put the microscope over, but uh, very, very focused, particularly on the other major capital cities around the country as well. So I'm going to wish you through some uh, data from CoreLogic. Um, these are the latest numbers. We actually see here that uh, Australians are now holding over $6 trillion in residential real estate. Um, we're holding, just out of interest, I suppose it is about uh, less than half that in, uh, in super. So something that we're very conscious of, um, particularly for our clients, is that there's a lot of 
advisory and support in that super space, but certainly a lot less advisory and support uh, when it comes to residential investment. And that's a big part of, of what we do, really making sure that our clients are buying the right thing at the right time in the right place and, uh, and selling uh, at the right time too. Uh, probably one other um, uh, just point on that is that we hold professional indemnity insurance. We're providing property advice underwritten by the Lloyds of London. Um, so had to, as a firm, we have to jump through a lot of hoops every year to, to have that re renewed, and we've never had a claim against us in 13 years. So just wish you through uh, a bit about what's going on around the country. Um, we've actually seen uh, national dwelling values recover, and you can see that there we're up about 1.7%. Um, over um, over the three months ending in September. So these are the, the this is the data ending in September. <coughs> and I suppose what, I think what's really interesting is obviously this is the zero line. This is where we've got we moved into negative growth here. We've actually very quickly popped back up into positive territory. And I think that's largely off the back of we had um, three interest rate drops in the last six months. I think uh, from memory June, July, and then in October as well. Um, so we've really started to see the market pick back up again, and that's something that we've noticed very much um, when we're actually going out there negotiating with agents and with buyers, or sorry, sellers. Um, so uh, we're whizzing around the capital cities now. This is Sydney, um, and I think once again, Sydney mirrors what we're seeing in the last slide. We've actually seen values increase by 1.7% just in September and by 3.5% over the three months to September. So the values overall are still down for the year, um, and they're down past their peak, but we've definitely seen uh, in the last three months um, uh, recovery and growth, um, and uh, uh, we've certainly seen that in Melbourne as well, um, which we'll get to um, just in, in a couple of slides. So what I'm gonna show you here, uh, which is pretty interesting, is that each quarter ComSec produce a great report called the State of the States. Um, it's actually publicly available. You're able to download it and uh, read it and pull it apart yourself. And what they do is they analyze eight key indicators uh, that we've listed here, and they stack rank all of the states from best to worst. So it's really like a, a report card that you know that one of your kids would get at school on how the state is actually performing, but from an economic standpoint. And I think, importantly, although it's the data state-based, much of the performance is really the capital city um, and, and capital city driven. So, so this data really serves as a great proxy for capital city performance. And, uh, and I think importantly as well as we actually see economic performance end up capitalised into the performance of real estate in that capital city. So often, you know, what we'll see mirrored here, um, a lot of this data here can very much be a lead leading indicator for what we can potentially expect <coughs> from, um, from that uh, capital city over the coming months. So we can see New South Wales is actually in second position on the overall performance rankings. Um, it's, uh, it's doing well on a number of factors. Um, it, it, just to, in terms of explaining this table, this is obviously the data point in that middle column, but I think perhaps more importantly, this is how it's going versus the decade average. So you can see that dwelling commencements are almost 15% up um, compared to the decade average, unemployment's 14% down, population growth is 11% up, economic growth is 25% up, and construction work is 27% up. So overall, you'd have to say that on a report card basis, um, New South Wales is actually doing pretty well, and we're seeing that, that, that it's in second, in second position on the overall uh, performance rankings. Once again, uh, this chart's interesting because it actually looks very similar to what we saw with the, um, uh, with the, the Sydney chart. We've seen uh, very much a, re a recovery uh, from the bottom, and I think what I was looking for is, you know, were we gonna see another double bottom, and perhaps uh, more weakness in this? But I, I think that with the, the interest rate cuts that we've had, that we'll see this very much pop back up into positive territory over the coming months. So values have increased for Melbourne by 1.7% in September, 3.4% over three months to September. And as I mentioned, like with the Sydney slide, values are actually down over the past year, but certainly over the past 90 days, we've seen the market recover. 
Once again, if we look at uh, uh, the, the report card, you can see here that Victoria is actually in first place on the performance rankings. Um, it's first on four of the eight indicators. Unemployment is down uh, over, over 10 years, over the decade. Economic growth is strong. Construction work is particularly strong. But you can see sort of a lot of good numbers here, uh, a lot of double-digit um, uh, improvement over the decade average. So overall, um, you know, Victoria's in, in pretty good shape. And look, we've certainly been, um, while I wouldn't be buying everywhere there, we've managed to pick up some, and been picking up good opportunities there in pockets for our clients. Brisbane, uh, Brisbane values increased by 0.1% in September. They were half a percent over the three months for September. And so a little bit of a fall over the past year, about 2%. Um, overall, it's been pretty flat in Brisbane. What we're seeing is Queensland is actually now in fifth position on the performance ranking, so dwelling commencements are down about 10%. And look, I, I think if you've been following property at all, it was fairly well reported that there was um, quite an oversupply of inner city apartments in, uh, in Brisbane. Um, we certainly think that there's opportunity in other parts of the city, but um, certainly stay away from those inner city apartments. But I think what we've seen over the last couple of years in particular is we've seen um, sales drop of those inner city apartments and we've seen uh, developers having more trouble getting credit. <coughs> so we've, these, these dwelling commencement numbers um, and it's certainly not surprising if you understand what's going on in the market there. Economic growth has been pretty good, up 20%. Um, the construction work has been down about 20%. Um, they don't have the same amount of infrastructure being built that we're seeing. There's, still, there's certainly still good infrastructure projects going on in Brisbane, but not quite the same degree that we've been seeing in, in Melbourne and Sydney. So these, these numbers aren't really surprising to us. So look, if um, we look at Adelaide, um, values have basically been moving sideways there. Um, they were down 0.6% over the three months to September. They've fallen gently over the past year, um, and they're a little bit down from their past peak. South Australia is in sixth position uh, behind Queensland. There's a few uh, good signs uh, there. We've seen quite good economic growth um, and, and fairly good construction work numbers there. We take a look at Perth. Um, I think the next couple of slides, Perth and Darwin, are interesting. We said values falling by 0.8% in September. Um, I think this chart's interesting here. You can see that we've been in negative territory for quite some time in Perth, um, and that's that's really showing up here. Where values have fallen by 9% over the past year, and they're actually values are down 21% um, since their 2014 peak. So certainly uh, Perth has struggled. And you can see here Western Australia is seventh or eighth in all the indicators. So these numbers here aren't surprising when you look at the overall report card. So you can see here dwelling commencements down 40%, population growth down almost 50%, equipment investment um, down 15%, housing finance down 27 construction work down 48 But I suppose this is really um, you know, coming off the, the, the weakness um, in mining. Um, and that really brings me to the next slide. So uh, one of the things we certainly look for, um, so, so really our research model works from a, um, a top-down perspective, so very much from the macro through to the micro through to the property level. And one of the, the interesting things about Perth is that Perth does really behave like a big mining town. And I think your, your view on Perth real estate has to take into account commodity prices. So we certainly keep an eye on um, a whole range of markets outside of real estate because they absolutely have a, um, a strong bearing on, on the property market um, in, in all of the different cities. So this chart I think is interesting in particular. We've actually seen iron ore prices that have been very strong over the past few years. Um, you can see that they've continued to rise, but in the just recently they've really started to drop off. And I think if you look at what's going on globally, uh, perhaps iron ore has reached a peak and it's on the decline. So that's not such great news for Perth. Um, but that said, we've, uh, uh, there's always bargains and opportunities in every city. Um, you just have to know exactly what to look for and, uh, and where to find it. So if we look at Hobart, um, we can see values have fallen a little bit in September. Um, they were 0.4% higher over the three months of September. Um, and so so uh, 
Hobart has actually had pretty good growth over the last few years. Um, values have increased by 2.5% over the past year, 0.7% um, lower than their March 2019 P. So it started to come off a bit. And Tasmania is actually in third position on the ranking. So you can see here that population growth, 114%. Um, economic growth has been uh, well in, into double digits there at uh, almost 20%, and equipment investment is up 35% over the decade. And I think what's really driven the economic growth in Tasmania has been agriculture. It's a very clean environment, um, there's great produce there. And I think you know, back when the mining boom was coming off, there was a lot of talk in Australia about a shift from a mining boom to a dining boom. And certainly, um, that's one of the great exports of Australia. And if we look at um, this, if we look at certain companies down there, there's been some great success stories. Bellamy's. Um, I don't know if you're share market investors, but Bellamy's has done pretty well. Um, it was formerly called Tasmanian Pure Foods, um, and uh, it's been quite a standout down there. So agricultural growth over the past financial year um, is up about 10 percent, according to the ABS. So agriculture in uh, Tasmania has, has been very, very strong and uh, that's showing up in the numbers there. If we look at Darwin, Darwin's been, Darwin's certainly had a very tough time. If you look at the chart here, it's been in negative territory for quite some time. So these numbers are uh, down 0.2% in September. Uh, that is 1% 1, 1 lower over the three months to September. That is fallen by 9% over the past year. And they're actually almost 31% off their peak. And uh, if we look at the Northern Territory, in terms of their report card, um, it's actually last. So we're seeing dwelling commencements down 60%. Population growth is well into negative territory. Construction work is a long way down. Um, there's a lot of, uh, well, pretty much everything's negative. So um, uh, not, a, not a good place to be economically at the moment, Northern Territory or Darwin. Canberra's actually been doing quite well. Um, you can see values are up 1% um, over just in the month, 1.4% over the three months, 1.3% over the past year, and the ACT is actually in the fourth spot. So unemployment's down, economic growth is quite good, 20% up on the decade, equipment investment up 16%, housing finance up 8%. So what we're seeing nationally is that the median selling, the median selling time has peaked across the combined capitals um, and it's started to drop. And that's actually a, a very telling signal, days on market, how quickly property's getting sold. So what we're really seeing there is that properties are being sold faster and really the market overall is recovering, it is, is recovering nationally. Um, so that's a, that's a very, very important number, how long properties are staying on the market. And certainly our experience as buyers agents, as buyers advisors, you're going out negotiating is that there's definitely more heat in the market than there was six months ago. Vendor discounting is starting to ease. We've been negotiating very well for clients. We've been getting great prices and great terms. And our view is there's still time to buy a well, but discounting is actually starting to ease. There's, there's a little bit more power um, shifting back from buyers into the hands of sellers. And uh, so really what we're seeing is the market heat up again. Migration is still high, our population growth is still very strong, and that's driving good demand for property. And what we're seeing as well is both house and unit approvals have been falling significantly, so supply is tightening. So going back 12 months, there was still quite a strong um, rate of approvals, um, 12 months, two years, and that supply response was um, certainly um, uh, well, relieving pressure on the market, but we've really seen that dry up. Uh, developers in particular are having a lot more trouble getting credit, and uh, really so a lot of the, the, the buying interest is going into existing property rather than new property. And I think from an interest rate perspective, uh, what we're seeing, we had, uh, I mentioned earlier, 225 basis point cuts in June and July. We had one in uh, October. Rates are obviously the lowest, uh, the lowest point ever. And really, this is a chart we keep our eye quite heavily on. It's the Interbank Cash Rate Futures. And really what the big money is saying is that it looks like we'll get one more rate drop before rates start to move back up again. And obviously rate drops are typically good news for property prices. So um, something that we get asked a lot is what's the future of property prices in Australia? Are we in a property bubble? We expect a collapse. Um, is there another boom coming? 
our view is that the future of property is actually a lot more certain than most people understand, and, and that's because most investors don't study history. We're very keen students of history. This is our description of the real estate cycle. Um, this diagram is up on our website. Um, this, is, this is an area that I don't have enough time to cover today. It usually takes us 40, 45 minutes to work through. Uh, we typically spend quite a bit of time on this. Um, it'd be great to come back and do this, perhaps do a session on this in a bit more detail. But our view is fortunes are built on understanding market cycles. This cycle typically occurs across 18 to 20 years, uh, peak to peak or bottom to bottom. It very clearly historically repeats. Um, it's quite predictable. And I think the interesting thing is, as an economy, Australia doesn't actually produce enough to generate its own cycle. It really follows the US cycle by about 12 to 18 months. Um, and really, it's, it's the US driving the global cycle because it's the world's highest output economy. So we've divided this cycle into four phases and uh, 24 stages. What I've done with this chart is it's basically a far more simplistic look. And so this cycle has two expansionary phases, two recessionary phases. The first phase here, we call this uh, first upswing or return to growth. And that's really what we've all just lived through from 2011 to 2018. That's really been the growth that we've had, um, that we've seen since the GFC. And the two growth phases are, are separated by a phase that we call the mid-cycle slowdown. Um, it's really, um, you probably call it a, a mini-recession, um, which is actually the phase that we are currently in. Um, and we expect to come out of that um, around about, it's difficult to time to the month, but probably around about the middle of next year. So we were always expecting 2019 and 2020 to be slower years based on our forecasting. And then we move into this boom phase, um, which we believe will run from about 2020 through to 2027. And then we'll experience this, what we call this peak crash recovery phase, which is typically about four years. Our view is that will be from about 2027 through to, through to about 2031. So I think what's interesting about the mid-cycle slowdown is that it does certainly bring out pessimism. It brings out a lot of perma there saying that you know, we're expecting a financial crisis. Our view is that won't happen in this part of the cycle. Um, but there's really, um, a, our view is that there is a boom coming from 2020 through to 2027 and that there'll be certainly a lot of money to be made during that period. Um, as I mentioned, yeah, beyond 2027, our modelling suggests a stronger recession than what we've just had in sort of 2019-2020, lasting about four years. So what we've typically seen uh, historically <coughs> is that the property price growth is stronger in this second boom phase than in this first phase. Our view is that um, typically Sydney and Melbourne, the big capital cities, lead out of a big cyclical bottom like what we had during the GFC. Um, and that's exactly what we've seen. So I think the growth of Sydney and Melbourne will probably be a little bit more subdued, probably more uh, single digit growth rather than the double digit growth that we've, we've certainly had for a number of years <coughs> during that seven year cycle. As I mentioned, I'd love to talk in a lot more depth about this because it is quite technical, but um, certainly our view is that there's, um, there's, there's some good growth coming and that uh, right now is a very good opportunity for you to position yourself for that uh, next seven years of a leg up that we expect from 2023 to 2027. That's more or less uh, all I have. I'm going to hand back to Jay. He's going to take you through uh, um, a range of challenges on the retirement front and um, just some opportunities for addressing that um, from a property perspective. Jay? Yeah. So what I wanted to talk about today is about retirement. So whether you're at that age where you're starting to consider retirement or you've got family that are going into that retirement phase, or obviously you're thinking about one day your children retiring, it's important to get a good understanding about the challenges that are facing retirement. Retirement, especially at an early age, is probably you know, the Australian dream. I guess it's the dream in pretty much any country. But the sad truth is that we're retiring later and we are retiring poorer. So, uh, according to the last ABS census, my daughter, who's now four, her predicted retirement age is going to be 82. So, these numbers are, are getting scarier and scarier as we start to look like, I can't get her to do any work now when she's four, so I can't imagine her doing anything <laughs> by the time she gets to that age. But one of the crazy statistics that recently came out was that 
uh, the percentage of people working over the age of 65 has tripled since 1990. And today, we, as I said, we're going to look at the most significant threats to your retirement, your children's retirement, and if you've got parents who can retire yet, their retirement. So the superannuation guarantee was introduced in 1992, and that was to address Australia's retirement income dilemma. According to the Australian Government's National Commission Audit, in spite of all of our savings in the super, projections show that 80% of us are going to require the pension over the next 40 years, still. So the sad truth is we all have super, but for a lot of us it's, it's not enough, it's not working. The ratio of workers to pensioners is dropping at an alarmingly fast rate. And that mean, means that the pensions can't afford to actually stay at the current rate that they're at. And when we look at this, at the moment there's five workers for every one retiree. By 2050, this is going to be 2.7 workers for every one retiree. So this decline in the number of younger workers obviously disrupts the balance that we've created over time of having more younger workers paying taxes which are used to financially support the elderly. So the cost of healthcare will increase and we're looking at an increase of about 77% by 2050, which is crazy. Uh, cost of age pension is going to increase by about 44% and <clears throat> age care is expected to rise in cost by 125%. So there's significant changes that are going to be seen in our lifetime. So if your plan, or your family's plan, is to rely on the pension, how is the government going to get the money with almost half the workers supporting those schemes? Australians, we're living longer, uh, and we need savings to fund a longer lifestyle for ourselves, a longer life. Life expectancy at birth in 1987 was 76, whereas Today, for males it's 81, for females it's 85. And by 2047, it's projected to be 90 years old. So as a result of living longer, our quality of health is obviously much lower. And anybody here that has older relatives um, can attest my, my great-grandparents, who are still alive, amazingly, uh, they're very active, but almost every single week in their calendar is a doctor's appointment. They're always going to the specialist or going to do this or that. That takes up a lot of their time. And it's going to consume more of your time, obviously, as you get older. People aged between 60 to 70 report fair or poor health more than any other Australian group. And it's also predicted by 2035, so not very far away, one in four men and one in five women in their 60s will have poor or at best fair health. So your access to better medicine, nutrition and fitness becomes more and more important as you get older. And obviously it's not cheaper. Now tax freedom day. Tax freedom day is a very important part of all of our lives. Who here pays tax? No one's from the ATO is here, so if you didn't put your hand up, it's fine. Um, but Australia is one of the highest tax-paying nations in the world, and our, and our top tax rate is funded by people earning the 180 grand mark and above, and that's 45% of that income per year, which is crazy. In 2019, and the numbers only came from the Mulligan, Australians paid over half a trillion dollars in income tax. So it's $560 billion in income tax. So... Uh, every time we talk about tax, we get a lot of emotions in the room. You can start to feel it. Um, but in regards to Tax Freedom Day and what it actually is, it's a concept that just helps you understand how your tax affects you. So I'll quickly run you through it. The best way I've found to describe this is, imagine you have a normal five-day job, Monday to Friday. Whether you're your own boss or whatever, but let's just imagine you have a boss. Your boss calls you in and they say, listen, you're doing a fantastic job, you're a valued employee, all the stuff they get taught to tell you. And then they say, what we're going to do is, we're going to make a few changes. We're only going to pay you for Wednesday afternoon, Thursday and Friday. And you're like, oh great, we're going to have to come in Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday coming in the afternoon. And they're like, no, 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 no. You're still coming in. You're still coming in Monday, you're doing all your work. But we're just going to pay you for those times. Who here would stay at that job? The insane thing about it is if you look at how we pay our tax and how it's structured, every single one of you is already doing that. 
and I'm going to show you how. So Tax Freedom Day represents the date at which Australians have worked enough to pay off their total tax bill for the calendar year. And basically, it represents how many days we work for the tax man before we earn for ourselves. It represents total taxes collected by all three levels of government, council, state, federal, and it includes indirect taxes as well, like GST. And according to some figures by Deloitte Economics, the average taxpayer ends up paying about two thirds more tax than they pay through their income tax. According to the uh, Centre of uh, Independent Studies, the results over the last 50 years show that Australians are actually paying their tax much later in the year as well. So you can see in 2019, you had to work until around the 17th of April to pay all your taxes. And this is actually one day further than what it was last year. So it is creeping more and more. And if we look at how Aussies compare to the rest of the world, in the US, it's the 24th of April, the UK, it's, May, it's the 8th of May, France, the 29th of July, Belgium, the 6th of August. Most other European Union companies are around early June, on average. Um, but understanding tax is so important because it is our largest expense. And I'm going to show you some strategies as to how to actually move Tax Freedom Day faster. Some of you have very smart advisors or are very smart yourselves and have probably already figured this out. But a lot of you have probably never sat down and actually seen it on paper how it does work. So are you happy for me to go through that? Yeah. Right. Now what I'm also going to do is throw something else into the mix. Who here pays a mortgage? Okay, so most of you. So the sad reality is, is now we've got to take the mortgage obligation on top of tax freedom. So we're now adding the two together. So basically what we look at is go, well, tax freedom day is going to be this day. When's my obligation to my bank to pay my mortgage also done? Let's combine the two and let's figure out what date that's actually going to be when I start making money for myself. You still got to pay utilities, school fees, all that other stuff, but this is just the obligation, okay? So according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, the average Australian household spends about three months of the year working to pay their mortgage. And we've got some, uh, some figures there from the last um, ABS census and uh, the dwelling price index there. So let's bring it all together to understand your position. So you work until April 17th to earn the money required to pay your tax for the year, plus another three months of your mortgage. So let's call it the 17th of July to pay off your taxes and your mortgage. So you're starting to earn money for yourself to do other things <coughs> on week 28 of 52. So around 53% of the years pass. So on a weekly basis, this is what it looks like. You start earning for yourself Wednesday afternoon. So Monday and Tuesday for taxes, Wednesdays for the bank, basically. <coughs> is it any wonder why a lot of people struggle to be able to save money for a deposit for a house? Is it any wonder why the government's creating schemes to help people with those first deposits? They need to do it. It's obviously too little too late for a lot of people, but these are the reasons why. And understanding that research really gets you a good understanding of how to get ahead of it. Now, I'm actually going to use a case study here example. And by the end of this case study, I'm going to show you how we improve this person's situation, not only for the tax that they're paying, not only for the savings that they're going to make, but also to paying off their home loan faster. Is everyone okay with that? So we're going to take John, his typical situation here. He's got a yearly income of $120,000, so I had to make some assumptions and I'll explain to you why I've done that as well. He pays $32,000 a year in tax. Uh, tax Freedom Day is April 7th, so 97 days or 26.5% of the year has already passed for John by the time he meets that ATO obligation. For his home loan, 25% of his income, as per Australian Bureau Statistics data, so $30,000 a year goes to his mortgage. So John reaches Mortgage Freedom Day and Tax Freedom Day together on July 7th. So 189 days of the year, or 51.78%, has now passed to John. John now has $58,000 left to earn for the rest of his year. And these are things as I said, utility, electricity, gas, rates, groceries, travel, insurance, you know, childcare, school fees, more. I mean, if, who he has children? Aren't they amazing? <laughs> have their little feet that can crush all of your big dreams. So the whole thing about that is that at the end of the day, there are so many more fees that come into it. See, I see so many parents nodding. So many fees that come into account that I'm not even going to talk about today. But you, as everyday people living your lives, already know what these costs are. So when it comes to savings, John will have very little. And according to a recent study by Suncorp, the average Australian saves about 427, let's say five grand a year 
That's the average savings that the Australian family has. So the main things for John is he wants to grow his wealth, he wants to minimise the tax that he's paying every year, bring tax freedom day earlier, and he wants to pay off his home loan faster. So we need to look at some numbers here. But first of all, Australian dwellings have grown on average by about 6.4% per year, as the chart will show you in your documents that you have in front of you. And uh, that's over the last 25 years. So the capital gains over the last 25 years equates to an annual growth rate of around 6.8% for houses and around 5.9% for units, which is always a good average to look at when you're personally looking at purchase and investment. Is it above that average? Is it below that average? What catalysts are going to move that property for me that I can identify with a certain degree of certainty? Now let's buy a very carefully selected property. We do not have time today to explain to you our three-tiered research methodology. Again, if you do want to come to that other event where we go through the property cycle, we will go through that in more detail. But today, let's just stick to the strategy. Let's assume we've done our job that we've been doing for 13 years. We did it right. What's the result of that? So we purchased a carefully chosen median price dwell, um, property, and the median dwelling price for combined capitals is around $602,000 at the moment. I'm going to use a case study that we did recently. It was $610,495, but to make it a bit simpler, I'll just say it's six hundred and ten dollars You can see it's up there. So by utilising the equity in his home, John's able to purchase a $610,000 investment property without the need of a cash deposit. So his cash flow still stays basically the same. After crunching all the numbers, we've actually found that the holding cost for the property is going to be, after tax, about $31 a week. So now he's got that in his budget, we've worked that out by the cash flow, all right? Every client that purchases a property should automatically do their numbers. With Providence, you are unable to buy a property unless we do do the numbers for you. The tax credits received, which are in this column here, average, after combining them all and looking at the average there, they average about $5,703.50 per year which is a discount to John's tax freedom day of around 17.8% or 16 and a half days. So now it's 16 and a half days earlier per year by purchasing this property. So the property is actually also accumulating wealth and based on 20 years historical performance, the average yearly increase in wealth for John in regards to equity is $44,853. It's not hard to imagine too, because I just showed you that the average was around 6.4%. I've actually averaged this down to 6.1%. So I've made it a little bit more conservative. So here are now John's numbers side by side, just so you can get a little bit more of an understanding for the comparison. He now pays $5,703.50 less in tax per year. He reaches tax free today 17 days earlier, and he starts earning money for himself on the 21st of March. The biggest change though, for John overall, for his financial future is now his savings plan, because now he's creating wealth. And that wealth is passive, and it's sitting there in the background for him. And he's basically increased what Suncorp said would be his $5,000 savings by almost 800%, which is going to change things for him significantly as he gets older. But these are only two out of the three things. He also wants to help his home loan faster. So now what we're going to do is have a quick look at mortgage freedom day, how we can change that as well, because we need to tip the scales on everything. Every client's going to have different requirements. You might not want all three of these. You might only want one or two of them. But this is just an example trying to incorporate all of them. So John has 600k owing on his home with principal and interest repayments. Uh, I modeled this on 4%. I'm not sure if you talk with Natalie and her team and they crunch your numbers and look at your circumstances. They can either do better or they can get you a better product that's going to allow you to do better at the end of the day. So make sure you speak to Natalie because they're fantastic and all of our clients that have used them have been really happy. So continuing with this, principal and interest repayments, roughly $30,000 a year based on the average details from uh, the ABS that I gave you. So that's around two grand in interest and about $1,000 in principal. In 10 years time, he would have reduced his home loan by 125K. So that's the debt for the principal that's gone now. At this rate, it's going to take him 30 years to pay off his home loan. But when we add an investment property to the exact same scenario there, so we're still in a position where John owes 600K, he's paying $30,000 a year, same position. But this time, as I said, John uses equity in his home to purchase an investment property that we spoke about earlier. So I took all the numbers from the initial cash flow report for you. Like before, in 10 years' time, John would have reduced his debt by 125K. 
but at that same 10 year period, he's got this investment property and it's working for him. And during that time and taking all selling costs into account, because it actually, if you are good at maths and did the numbers in your head, this is well over $400,000, but we're gonna okay, take capital gains tax. The holding cost for this property, by the way, over this period of time, was just shy of $13,000 out of pocket after tax, when I took all of the calculations into account. So based upon this, he's made $300,000 profit. That shaves around 63% off that loan, which is the equivalent to 14 and a half years of repayments. So John is now able to pay off his home based on that strategy from that point that we originally started, 15 and a half years. So I've just showed you tax, savings, paying off your home loan. I'm sure some of you have already done this, you've already participated in the strategy, but it is very interesting to actually look at it on paper and how it works. And hopefully the assumptions I've used are very conservative, so you might have done better than John. If I can leave you with some takeaways before I call Simon up, just to give you a little bit more context, just before we finish and, and take questions before Natalie comes and uh, gives you some more well-needed knowledge on finance. The main takeaways would be that the property market is predictable. We can show you how. And there's a video that Simon's actually done on the property cycle. We'll make sure it gets circulated around if you can't make our event that we have on the 13th. Seek professional help. I mean, hopefully if you're all here today, you have sought professional help and that's why you're here next year. Implement these strategies and improve your future now because from the statistics that I showed you before, you don't want to wait. And come and speak with us. We're just at Barangaroo. Room. Uh, happy to have a chat with you. It's obligation free. Let's see if we can explore some things. As I said, I'm just going to call Simon up here for a quick second, if you don't mind, and just give some context as to some of the most recent properties we've purchased and why. Is that okay? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Chad. <coughs> so, um, most of us, what we do, uh, we present on a pretty regular basis, and everyone's always quite fascinated at uh, you know, the kind of things that we're buying for clients. We don't have a lot of time today, so I'm just going to show you three very quick examples. But um, raise your hand if you're saving forty or fifty thousand dollars a year. Anyone saving forty or fifty thousand? I can't see any hands. Um, well, that's why you need something like this. Um, this could have been your forty or fifty thousand dollar year savings plan over the next ten years. Uh, but another client got it, um, and over that period, it'll cost them nothing to hold. So. It's a bit of an ugly duckling, it's probably not your ideal home, it's not your dream home, and that's perfectly fine. Um, so this is, uh, we picked it up for $615,000. Um, I suppose a couple of the key facts here are, um, it was on a 4.5% rental yield. So I think with rates in the low threes for investors, or low to mid threes, a property like this will cost very little, this is in the first few years, may cost a little bit to hold, it will cost, I mean, depending on what your income is, but it cost close to nothing to hold. Um, but I think a couple of the, the important things, you can see it's on 950 square metres of subdividable land, and that's subdividable right now as of right. Um, so if you wanted to, it's on a flat block, um, we could actually put two 470, we'll cut into two 475 metre blocks, and we could put, um, or you could put, two dwellings on that. You could sell one, you could keep one, you could sell both. Um, or you could just keep both. Um, and you'd certainly see a great return. Or you could just continue to hold that property. And what we've seen for a lot of our clients who have held this kind of thing for some period is particularly with blocks of that size, eventually densities change. It might be five years or 10 years. And at some stage, it's probably going to be subdividable into three. So really good upside in something like this. It's, it's in a suburb that's consistently shown uh, great capital growth over an entire cycle of about 20 years, 8.1% annualised. It's uh, The suburb has very low vacancy. Uh, it's, it's pretty close to a train station, shopping centre, uh, close to Westfield, and it's 16 kilometres to a major CBD. And look, it is in Brisbane. Um, but the challenge for a lot of clients, a lot of our clients are in that sort of 500 to 1 million, 500k to 1 million dollar space. Um, really our volume's in that 500 to uh, 500k to 2 million dollars. Um, but it's very difficult to find something that represents that kind of value in Sydney. As I'm sure you would, uh, you would agree. This was another one, this was a client of ours that was in Melbourne and they were moving back to Perth. So we did go and find them something in Perth. 
Uh, you can see we pick this up for $800,000, character high on 1,000 square metres. And the interesting thing about this is it actually had a granny flat already at the back. So although the block's actually able to be subdivided right now today, it's already got a dual income. So rental yield was 4.6%. Um, it's really in that cash flow neutral to cash flow positive space. Um, uh, the ability to subdivide it into two lots, so um, very much like the previous block, you can force some value on that um, either now, today, or sometime down the road. Um, and close to the train station, close to shops, um, 16 k's to Perth. So look, obviously Perth is um, you know, having a few challenges economically. Um, at the moment, but you know, we're long-term investors, we really take a 10 or 20 year view. And this client had very specific reasons for buying there. I mean, we have other clients that don't want us to buy in Sydney because they've got too much property in New South Wales, they've got land tax issues. So, you know, depending on your particular circumstances, um, that will determine where we actually look um, for you. This was something else we picked this up in Brisbane. Um, a bit of a cheapy, half a million dollars, three years old. Um, so it's really, this property was a real set and forget. It was actually already tenanted. So tenanted at 5.2%, that was really at market, uh, market rates. So really with, with rates, interest rates where they are, um, that's really in the cash flow positive bucket. Um, good quality builder, um, good quality land estate, 17 kilometers to the city. Um, and it's, it's really just a, a good meat and potatoes uh, investment that we think will go well over the next 10 to 15 years. Um, I could, I actually, I've got a huge list of those, but we just have to rip them out because we're, we're short for time. So um, we'll hand back to Natalie. And we'll take some Good morning, everyone. My name is Natalie, and thank you to Simon and Jay for your property update. Today I'm going to be talking about finding and lending and the changes in this space. So today, just with the overview of what I'm going to be discussing, why is it more difficult to get a loan approved in the current environment? What key areas do lenders look for when assessing your application? Some debt strategies that you could look to implement to pay off your home loan faster and at a lower interest rate. Some financial planning considerations to take into account when acquiring new debt, and finally, how the next year mortgage breaking process works. So, firstly, why is it more difficult to get a loan approved in the current environment? This graph here illustrates the loan approval statistics from 2018 to 19 financial year. Over in the left, there's the owner-occupied space, which represents about 70% of the total loan market. This has decreased just over 11% in the 18 to 19 year. And the same with the investment home loan approval rates. This has decreased even more at 15.6%. So why? We're just going to look at why is this so. So firstly, the cost of living disclosure. So about two years ago, when you applied for a home loan, you just disclosed what your cost of living was, just on a line, just a one line basis. Now, when you apply for a loan, you have to disclose an itemised breakdown of each of the cost of living expenditure items, which includes things like groceries, recreation, entertainment, childcare, <coughs> uh, transport. So. They're also, dis they're also cutting down on discretionary spending. So things like Uber Eats, Netflix subscriptions, gambling applications, and also Afterpay. So now that they're looking at these cost of living breakdown, they're also asking for a higher level of supporting documentation. So for example, for if you have an existing investment property, they're looking for evidence um, to support these expenses such as copies of your strata levy notices or rates notices. This also includes additional information in relation to bank statements. And then finally, the responsible lending obligation. So now bankers and brokers now have to ask additional questions when, um, when clients are seeking a loan. This includes if there's going to be any changes to their circumstances in the short term in the next, say, 12 to 18 months. 
for example, if um, the client is looking to go with maternity leave, the bank wants to ensure that that you, as the client, will be able to service the loan in that change of circumstance. So what key areas do lenders look for when assessing your application? So firstly, when you lodge an application, the lender looks at any past events. They look at your credit rating to see if you've any, had any defaults or any late payments, such as on your credit card or if you've had any late payments on utility bills and things like that. They also look at your future, future ability to repay the loan. So the bank will see how predictable and secure your income is. So for example, um, a client that's a contractor employer, as opposed to a full-time salaried employee, will be assessed differently. And one is the property that you're looking to buy. So this is based on the price, the LVR, the lender valuation ratio. So banks often offer a more competitive interest rate for a lower LVR. And then finally, the location of the property. So now I'm just going to go through a couple of things that affect your borrowing capacity or borrowing power. So credit card limits. Credit card limits are actually assessed on your credit card limit and not the amount owing. So let's take a look at an example of this. So John has the following credit cards with various lenders. So as you can see here, the amount owing isn't too much at just over 3000 and the credit limit totals $90,000. John disclosed that he had no other debt, so he didn't have any other mortgage in place or he didn't have car loans, things like that. He also, dis he also disclosed that the credit limit of $25,000 was sufficient and that he was adamant that he wanted to keep the CPA credit card. So by cancelling the other two credit cards and um, reducing his credit card limit from $90,000 to $25,000, this actually increases his borrowing capacity by $330,000, which is quite substantial. Another item that can affect your borrowing power or capacity is line of credit facilities. Now, this is assessed the same way as a credit card, as it's assessed on the facility and not the amount owing. So this amount needs to be also included in the servicing calculator when applying for a loan. So now I'm just going to go through some quick three, um, three strategies that can look to pay off your home loan faster and add a lower interest rate. So firstly, um, paying off your mortgage faster, but using additional surplus in order to pay down the loan. So let's take a look at an example of how this is illustrated. So Ben has a $500,000 mortgage and the interest rate is 3.15% per annum. And now he's five years into his 30 year loan term and because he's received a pay rise at work, he considers um, contributing an extra $50 a week to the loan. This will allow Ben to save just under $27,000 of interest and then also pay off the loan three years faster by just contributing an extra $50 the next example, um, sorry, sorry, I'm going to go through today is refinancing your home loan. And uh, this is very popular at the moment with the low interest rate environment. So, bank, sorry, Australians are known to be loyal to their banks. However, if you've been with your bank for quite a while, you may not be getting the best interest rate on offer. Banks tend to offer better and more competitive interest rates for new customers in order to draw new business in and they might not be passing on the rate cut or the more competitive interest rate to their existing customers. So let's take a look at an example of refinancing your home loan. So Ethan has a home loan and it's at $1.2 million and he's currently with Bank A. Bank A is offering an interest rate of 3.92% per annum and the monthly repayment is 5600 per month. Ethan has saw that the Bank B is offering an interest rate of 3.09% per annum and this has a monthly repayment of $5,118 per month. 
So by refinancing over to Bank B, Ethan will save 556 per month, which equates to 6,600 per annum in repayments. Now this graph here just illustrates the repayments over a 30 year loan term. And as you can see here, Bank A's interest is significantly higher over the 30 year loan term. So much so that between Bank A and Bank B, the interest differential is $200,000. So I just thought I'd touch on some other refinancing considerations um, and it's not just all about a more competitive interest rate. So when refinancing, it's important to think of uh, the legal fees involved, settlement fees and also valuation fees. In addition, if you have a fixed rate home loan and you are looking to refinance over to another lender, you will generally incur a break cost. So it's important to consider all the fees when refinancing to, a, to another bank. Now finally, I'm just going to touch on the final strategy today, which is debt consolidation. So debt consolidation works when you bring all your debt together under one repayment and generally at a lower interest rate. So taking a look at this example here, which is a real life example that we recently implemented for one of our clients. This client had a home loan of $700,000. She also had credit card de debts worth $70,000 and a home uh, a personal loan of $40,000. Now in this example, she had significant equity within her home as the LPR was around 47%. By incorporating the credit card and the personal loan into the home loan and paying it an interest rate of 3.5% per annum, she was able to receive a total interest saving of just over 1,100 per month, or equates to about $13,000 per annum, which is much better than, I guess, you can spend that on a holiday instead of, I guess, paying that to bank. I also thought I'd just mention that debt consolidation can also be completed upon refinancing, so you could implement both strategies at the same time. So when acquiring the debt, there's just a couple of things that are important to consider. However, it usually gets left off the to-do list. So firstly, to review your risk management position. So if you were unable to meet your mortgage repayments, an insurance policy can look to implement and repay the loan repayments if you were unable to work due to sickness, illness or injury. Or if something were to happen to you, the insurance policy could look to implement and repay debt in that instance. So it's important to consider that when you're acquiring this new debt, that you have the same level of cover in order to meet your current circumstances. And also it's important uh, to review your estate planning and um, making sure that your affairs are up to date. If applicable, it's important to include then your new purchase in the will. Now I'm just going to touch on the next year mortgage broken process as the last item for today. So the next year mortgage broken process is completed in three different stages. So the first stage is the information collection stage, where we gather all your information um, and supporting documentation in order to ascertain what your borrowing capacity is. So we collect all the statements and supporting documents, including assets, liabilities, the cost of living breakdown, as I mentioned before. It's important to disclose how many dependents you have or um, how close you are to retiring, as the bank would like to see. If you are close to retiring, when you are taking out the loan, what the exit strategy might be to be able to repay the loan if you aren't earning an income in the Stage two is the filtering and negotiation stage. So this is where we take all the lenders available on the market and then we filter it down to all the lenders suitable on the market and then finally all the lenders available to your specific goals and objectives. For example, if you disclose that you would like an offset account or a personal banking relationship, we would take that into consideration when 
recommending a suitable loan contract for you. Once we filter that down, we provide you with the top three lenders that we have recommended. This incorporates the interest rate, so we provide you with both the fixed and the variable rate for your consideration. The comparison rate, which includes the bank fees, so that you can see what the real rate or the true rate is. What your maximum borrowing capacity is with each of those three lenders, as borrowing capacities differ, differ from lender to lender. And then finally, the ongoing application fees that the bank charges. So now, once we've provided you with that lender shortlist, you can be well equipped to make an informed decision on which way you would like to go. Once you've advised us which lender you would like to proceed with, we will then send you out the application for signing. And once this is sent back to us, we will then send off all the supporting docu documentation with the application already supplied in stage one. From there, we will then liaise with the financial institution and yourself directly from the loan ap application stage all the way to the approval stage. So today I thought I would just provide you with a few key takeaways. So the lending environment has tightened and it's harder to get a loan approved. However, it's important for this to not deter you from seeking out what your options are. Banks assess credit cards at their limit and line of, credit, line of credit facilities at their facility limit rather than the net amount only. Debt strategies such as refinancing your home loan and debt consolidation can look to reduce your interest costs and potentially pay down your home loan faster. And finally, it's prudent to review your estate planning and insurance arrangements when acquiring new debt. Thank you.